All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Um, just checking. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, let's get started then. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for confirming. Hey, uh, hi guys. Um, welcome everyone to this talk. And uh, my name is Vinod. I'm the PMC chair for Apache Hoodie. And in today's talk, uh, we thought we'll share a State of the Union kind of update uh, about the project with some directional guidance and with, with all of the Apache community. So um, just to quickly introduce myself, um, I mostly have like a database background. I have been uh, building databases for uh, almost my entire career, um, you know, starting from Oracle, uh, Golden Gate CDC, Walmart Key Valley Store at LinkedIn. Um, more recently, I was at uh, a principal engineer console and working on Kafka Key SQL DB stream processing. And of course, it was created uh, when when I was working on the data team at Uber and among other things. Right. So um, let's get into today's agenda. We start by describing the origins of Hoodie. Uh, you know what what the like that brought transactions, updates, deletes, and incrementals. And uh, we discuss the current components then, and how they present a cohesive sort of like uh, platform that you that makes life easy for users. And um, also we discuss about community, ongoing work, how you can get involved some of the major uh, work that's going on, and we'll do Q and A then. All right. So the origins of Hoodie uh, itself, right? Uh, let's go back to the roots. Uh, this will be like a short history tour as well as a quick intro to the project for, for those of you who are not familiar. So for us, this was started uh, during uh, our time at uh, Uber, uh, rooted in pretty you know like, uh, hard real problems. The business was scaling really well, but we were doing you know batch addition like everybody else. Uh, trying to build the, the Hadoop data lake, and then things were very slow because you know big batch jobs added up. Uh, we had to in, ingest like large scale database changes into um, like set of raw tables on on top of the data lake, and we had to rewrite entire tables or partitions several times a day. And we thought, hey, that that should be like a better way to do this, right? Plus, this didn't stop at the raw tables themselves. Uh, you typically write more ETLs, right? And uh, all these ETLs had no intelligence as well to sort of, you know, like smartly recompute. And uh, as as I introduced and later having data, whenever let's say, um, you know, you, you took an Uber trip or something, and then uh, you didn't you didn't send the data for a while, maybe your your phone run of battery or something like you'll get later raving data for a number of reasons and then every, every time something like that happened uh, we had this notion in, in back then that partitions have to be immutable and all of that right so generally speaking this caused a lot of impedance mismatch in how we do data processing and uh, having having you know seen uh, like you know i have a lot of stream processing background and database background so for me i started like looking at hey how is this done in stream processing uh, right, um, it, the the connection may not be super obvious because we we somehow uh, started looking at the batch programming model associated with a bunch of query engines and a bunch of like storage. Right, batch means let's say Spark, Hive, Flink, or you know Presto, some some of these engines on S3 or HDFS or some cloud storage, and then streaming has come to mean like you know Kafka, Pulsar, any of the event streaming systems processing stream processing using like you know, frameworks like Kafka streams or Flink or any you know, of the other great uh, stream processing things, right? But if you if you decouple it and just look at it, right, the streaming stack is actually pretty uh, intelligent in the sense that it only incrementally processes things, right? It doesn't like bulk recompute. It's actually so it's able to be fast and efficient because it's only like you know processing incremental quantities of data, and then uh, uses a state store to sort of like compute intermediate results, and then output strings back, right? But the problems there are it's not row oriented. Uh, sorry, it's row oriented, uh, not columnar because obviously most of the streaming stacks optimize for uh, you know like 
<clears throat> like sub sub second uh, processing latencies uh, from input to output, right? And then uh, the storage tends to be more OLTP oriented and not scan optimized. But if you take the batch stack now, we only had the one programming model, which is hey, either take partition by partitions or like you know reprocess entire tables. Uh, we had efficient columnar formats. We had scans, uh, you know, scalable compute. But the problem with this is there is no intelligence uh, around incrementally processing anything. So things are pretty inefficient, right? So we mostly Hoodie started out as a reimagination of, okay, what if we built a storage layer where we can expose tables, streams out of tables, which is sort of like what most databases do. And then um, on the other side, we support updates and deletes and transactions. So this way, if you think about it, you can actually do uh, consume streams if you want, or you know, join it against another snapshot all without moving data back from between the data lake to outside systems outside or anything, right? So our, we started with this vision that every pipeline uh, can be made incremental, fast and efficient. And that's what we call, when we say stream processing on data lakes is what we mean by incremental processing, right? And we, we're borrowing the streaming programming model and placing it on top of batch data. So uh, yeah, we, we put out this like pretty old, like you now now a pretty old article on O'Reilly around some of these concepts, right? And that's actually how we got started. We weren't really uh, you know trying to build a like a format of any sort, and, and we'll get to that before, later. And when we sat down and thought about this problem, like I mentioned, this is basically a database problem, and most databases have indexes data and then a bunch of metadata that references transactions and things like that, right? So Actually, uh, we we pioneered a whole bunch of things here, which is uh, you know um, serverless transaction layer uh, over lakes. Uh, so we we built it uh, in line with how most of the data lake workload was running, right? Which is mostly as uh, you know batch jobs that are periodically scheduled. But these jobs can now get a transaction layer that can be embedded into it. You can continue taking advantage of on-demand compute and all of those uh, great things to reduce your cost and increase efficiency. And then we uh, built it first in a very multi-engine way. The very first version of Hoodie supported uh, like Hive, Spark, and Presto, for example, as we were, right? And then we now decouple the storage and transaction layer from the engine, and which was which was something that, that was pretty new at that time. And we introduced these notions, copy and write and merge and read, uh, different ways to think about uh, the trade-offs between query performance, data freshness, and and also like it it brought um, you know into perspective why you need background services like what databases have to maintain and manage your lake. And uh, this is a unique contribution that that remains to this day on Hoodie, which is we have record level uh, chain streams because uh, going back to the original problem, we had to also solve for derived data, right? And these ideas are now heavily borrowed outside, right? And then sometimes it may, it, it, it may be easy to forget, but it's important to give credit to uh, even all the early contributors in the project who had all these like seminal contributions help pioneer, pioneer these new things, which are now become like sort of ways of life in the industry, right? And, and a lot of this started uh, with, with the Hoodie community here. And quickly, we support uh, you know two type two major types of organizing data. Uh, one we call copy and write, uh, where if essentially we just keep like a parquet file, and each commit basically produces uh, you know each insert or update produces a new version of the data uh, data file. And then uh, we also maintain metadata where you can actually efficiently extract what records changed uh, after each commit. Uh, merge and read is a more uh, it's a full blown log structured database almost. Um, it has great flexibility because uh, if you have updates and deletes, it's going to log it to like a delta log file associated with each each kind of like parquet slash base file that you have, and uh, this is sort of what you need uh, for kind of like high scale large scale workloads where you have like data always streaming into the lake, not you know, periodically loading things into the lake, right? Um, so 
like let's say people like Uber or ByteDance, TikTok, large scale users kind of tend to deploy something like this. To again help uh, grip the reality of what it all, how it all looks underneath, um, right? What we do is uh, when you when you perform a write to like a hoodie table, we organize data in what we call as file groups. Uh, the idea is uh, each incoming record is keyed and it's mapped to uh, you know one of these groups. Um, the this mapping logic can be like different ways, right? Like it can have many different schemes to do that, and um, we you know either version files implicitly as in copy and write or create logs within this file group as you get updates, deletes, inserts to records within each file group. And finally, we you know we write the data out, and then we commit uh, everything to an event log. So you can think of this as uh, if you're familiar with uh, event streaming, event-driven architectures. Um, this is like an like an event log where you you log a set of actions that happened on the on the on the table. We only rely on, for example, atomically writing. Uh, uh, like uh, object into cloud storage or atomic renames on HDFS to, to transactionally commit all this. And then all of this uh, changes that you made gets internally replicated into like a metadata table, which contains a whole bunch of metadata that helps us you know, better plan queries and all of that. Any query would actually consult this commit, uh, this timeline uh, of you know, events that happen on the, on to the table along with all the metadata uh, that, that it has, and then try to read the right file slices. And if it has to merge and log and base files, it merges the base and log files before it can go ahead. And like diving a little bit more, uh, let's say you have an absurd, right? And then it, it let's say it, it went and uh, sort of like, you know, like added a, a version um, for each of these uh, file groups that you see here, then there are different queries now. Uh, we have a read optimized query, which can simply just read the base file. So it can remain purely columnar. Uh, for example, uh, you may not care about data freshness at all. Uh, so you, you may not want to incur the log merging overheads. So you can opt for this. Uh, typically, ML training jobs and things like that, which are scoring for better models, better signals, can, can use something like this, right? And then a snapshot query always presents the latest snapshot of the table as of the last committed time. And then incremental query uh, is something where we can actually uh, pull from the log or the base file using record, record change markers that we have to sort of really get uh, changed in out of, out of these things. Okay, that said, right? That this this is kind of the, the fundamentally what Hoodie was when we started uh, on on the Apache journey, and thanks to the power of the community, we have actually come a long way, and and it it would it would be like you know unfair not to give the community all the credit and recognition for all the great work that has been done. So earlier this year, we actually started a discussion in the community thread around you know painting a more accurate picture of the project. Um, you know, writing up kind of like how, what are the different features and capabilities in the project and how they sort of like, you know, uh, play with each other, right? And to understand, I think we can actually trace back what, what really happened, right? How, how we got here. So we published the core ideas, uh, like I mentioned, way back. We actually built the first version uh, in Oswald Uber with, with all the stuff that I just talked about. And 2017, we open sourced uh, the project by Uber. And then uh, we were actually working, started to build an open source community. We, you know, even then we got started with merge and read, cloud support, and all of these things um, in open source. And then we kept picking more adopters. We added more engine support. So people, you know, the basic things, right? And then we started building out our meta servers. Um, like more uh, asynchronous compaction, like uh, concurrency models. And then finally, we decided to incubate the project in 2019. And uh, right away, right, uh, a lot of people started using the project. And then, um, yeah, there were obvious uh, platform gaps, like upper level 
use case level uh, gaps that started to show up, and then the community really stepped up uh, to to actually build tooling and uh, utilities and everything along these these uh, these paths. We graduated in 2020, um, and then you know continued to add like large features like incremental cleaning, bootstrapping, sort modes, CSV based ingestion, and all of that. But it, like this uh, year, if you look at it, right, we've accelerated on where we added clustering, file listing metadata, like you know commit notifications. We have Spark DML support now. Uh, you can do Flink and a lot of continuous queries with uh, multi. Like you know, we support both Spark and Flink writers. Uh, we introduced like a multi writer with optimistic concurrency control. A bunch of pre-commit validation that you can use for data quality checks. Most recently, we landed our Kafka Connect Sync. Uh, we had a lot of sources either you know built up either in like you know PRs or landed uh, you know S3 event streams, JDBC connectors, pulsar connectors, and whatnot. Right. So what you actually then see is typically people are, are able to take uh, the hoodie components and then uh, actually build an end to end data lake and then have it be, you know, have the optionality of being, um, you know, querying it from all the major lake engines and all the major data processing frameworks. So typically people, you know, what we've seen is they, they extract event streams somehow. And then once they have event streams, uh, you simply run the Delta Streamer utility to build the raw tables, gives you like a simple one command solution for you to start building all these tables. But then, then you can write batch ETLs using Spark, Flink, Hive, uh, and query the, those tables, while you can also use some of the functionality that we have around Spark and Flink to write more incremental uh, data processing pipelines that I, that I talked about. So, um, so let's get few few other things out of the way, right? So like oftentimes we've heard that like, oh, hoodies, the hoodie format, right? So so is hoodie a format, right? That's that's basically what I want to discuss. So it's I think what when people say that they loosely mean a file format or, or a table format, which has also been introduced more recently, right? So hoodie was never designed as any general purpose format, right? Even the first version of hoodie had uh, transaction updates, but also had all the upper, like, you know, like something to clean the table, uh, reclaim storage, uh, something that can do rollbacks of the data, restore, save points, and, and database functionality uh, fundamentally, right? And we were trying to simply, like, not invent a table format, if you will. We tried to play with the high uh, format, and, and it has its strengths and also, like, you know, shortcomings, as we all know. Right, but it's ubiquitous. It's optimized. Many, like for example, engines like Presto, heavily optimized for the on the Hive connector. So it made sense to you know kind of like embrace that lot more. Uh, pretty much every every uh, uh, warehouse or their cloud on prem have an external table support using something like Hive. So, but over time, we've actually uh, extended Hive, or you can look at it as our own native table format, where instead of the high format, for example, relies on actually storage file listing to get the listings. But we have our own internal metadata table which can uh, answer that. Uh, so we we you can you can think about it as we we build up table format purpose built for incremental processing, but it's just one component in the entire uh, hoodie stack, as you will see. Is hoodie simply a transactional layer? Yes, hoodie does provide uh, transactions, updates, deletes. Uh, but it has like very different uh, design choices around event logs and how we want. Um, so our goal is to be able to do more things incrementally, right? Which means there is more chance for contention. So the so we try to avoid logs as much as possible, uh, and we try to keep like you know that's why we embrace a lot more MVCC based concurrency control and and all of these things. So you can view actually hoodie. Uh, yeah, hoodie is a transaction layer, but not simply. Because uh, it's also you can view it as a serverless database because it it supports change capture it supports like you know a bunch of other things uh, that you don't find in just like a, you know a thin transaction layer. So a more accurate description is that it's a platform, right? Where you can run both kind of streaming and batch style programming models, uh, data pipelines, and it provides, if you will, a state store for incrementally merging and writing these. Uh, like incremental slash streaming style data pipelines. 
and it gives you CDC, just like how you know Apache Kafka topics or like also topics give you uh, a change stream to consume from, right? And then it's actually built for data like workloads. Uh, so we we do all this while we optimize for large scans, and then something you know a process like clustering optimize the table, and and this is like you know uh, used for large scale data processing at one of the largest data lakes in the world, right? Like an exabyte at something like ByteDance, and then uh, you know several hundred petabytes at uh, Uber and other play, other large places, right? Yeah, you can. So you can use uh, like Hudi uh, to build build lake houses as well, but uh, I think we we actually offer the the kind of this more the streaming model, which I think is a little bit unique. But but you can view it build lake houses uh, using Hudi as well. So, but so the thing is with open source, right? There's a lot of uh, different components. Uh, it's it's great that it's open. The community aspects of it, it's all it's all awesome. But you know, sometimes you also need to put things together, though, right? If you have too much loose coupling, it becomes like a little bit hard to integrate. Uh, so, for example, the Delta Streamer tool can understand Kafka checkpoints, and it also understands Hoodie commit times, and it, they can keep it in sync, right? So that is a very uh, valuable thing for users to have, and, and not be able to like you know reason with it and and implement it uh, many many times over. So by by doing uh, kind of the more uh, platformy, tightly integrated components, we are able to actually reduce the build out time for operationalizing data lakes, which in my opinion is the single biggest problem for the data lake architecture today, and and that we had like great success with with something like this. So, uh, like you know, without without further further ado, right? Like uh, putting everything together. It is an OSI network stack kind of like picture of what the project provides. So the lowest layer, uh, what we have is lake storage, right? So we keep every all the data on cheap, scalable, Hadoop compatible storage. Uh, it can be in-memory file systems, cloud storage, HDFS, any other thing that fits under the Hadoop file system, we can store it on top. And we only use open and open file and data formats, uh, specifically, you know, Apache licensed. Apache project so far, right? And we, what we built at the lowest layer is uh, putting this together a transactional database kernel. If you if you go read like a database textbook, you'll find like the database kernel where it has, you know, like a storage format, which I think is what we call as a table format here in this land. Uh, if you look at it, it's one component, right? You typically build indexing, concurrency control, a bunch of daemons, you know, um, which are doing uh, useful things, uh, maintaining the storage on top. And then you typically have like a buffer cache kind of thing, right, to speed up queries. And then you you have some catalog or some sort of like metadata uh, server as well. So we built, uh, you know, some versions of all of this. And uh, and we with the like different concurrency models. And then on top of that, we offer uh, SQL, and you know programming apis where uh, you can either you know um, read and write uh, using sql or uh, like a java flink or a, a spark rdd based client and then for the readers we support time travel change capture query snapshot resolutions and like i mentioned like uh, there's a rich set of platform services on top where with anything from you know, ingresses, transformers that can understand CDC events from like, let's say Debezium or, uh, you know, like uh, the Amazon's uh, data migration service are common like CDC formats, which can automatically do log deduplications, uh, push notifications to rest endpoints or Kafka for when commits happen, uh, snapshot is stored. So a whole bunch of functionality and a CLI for you to like monitoring uh, to operationalize your data lake. And it's universally queryable from like popular engines, and and including like say like Redshift, right? And then the community is already working on things like BigQuery and stuff like integrations. So in the coming slides, I think we will we will go uh, step by step in each of these components, and and try to um, you know just to try to understand them, uh, what the design trade offs are, what's the current work that's going on, um, and all of this. 
All right. So the lake storage, uh, you know, we sit on top of Hadoop compatible file system, and we also have a wrapper file system actually, which can provide things like file sizing, buffering, and metrics uh, transparently on top of any underlying storage that you write to. We try to leverage upends whenever possible, uh, unlike unlike uh, you know more more other systems, um, because there are lots of you know large HDFS uh, kind of systems out there, and then even some cloud storage systems would support that. This actually helps us keep the metadata, which is like the number of files overhead minimal, and then help scale for extremely large tables. And um, yeah, in the future, I think we we want to try try and see if we can. Uh, you know, leverage some of the lower level APIs to do more interesting things here. As far as file formats, we basically have a base on the Delta log files, right? And then Parquet, ORC, H file are the current like base file supported. Uh, there is an arrow log file uh, format that we are, all our data in the, in the log files are an arrow right now. And then what the other interesting thing that we do is we try to encode any changes to the base files as um blocks into the um in 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 there so you can actually like look at each um of this like a base file and all the log format as a ordered set of like blocks uh which encode deltas that if you apply on top of the base file you get the next snapshot right and we actually have a lot of ongoing work here uh, for large batch rides. Uh, yeah, we are trying. We are looking at logging parquet blocks directly. I think there's a PR open already for that already. We are looking into also supporting uh, CSV or more. CSV is kind of semi-structured. It has a structure, but the schema can be like you know off, right? Uh, unstructured formats. We JSON. There, there's still a lot of data out there, so we can actually if we can support those things. We'll be able to you know compact them over time into into different formats that that's another kind of like interesting idea and the other great thing about this log is if you look at it right um like with with all the work that's going on around data privacy where we want to serve masked and unmasked and different kind of like copies for of a given record for based on the user we can actually pre-materialize a bunch of you know masked unmasked or encrypted unencrypted versions uh, here and then we want to actually build more uh, like functionality for queries to express what what is the access level control, what data a user is able to see. And again, we can do all this because of this sort of like unique uh, like base and delta log format design that we have. Coming to the table format itself, right? Uh, so broadly, it consists of the following, right? You have to store schema with some evolution rules. So we do use Avro, scheme, Avro as a schema. So we follow Avro schema evolution rules. And uh, we, like we mentioned, we have this notion of file groups uh, and we bucket, uh, like we, so the other thing we do is we place records uh, close to the base file. We all, you can always associate, uh, like when, when, when you read a base file, you can always associate a set of log blocks that dirty that base file. Uh, so this means we have like, you know, merge overhead is reduced when we try to uh, merge everything, right? And then the timeline uh, is an event log, like I mentioned. And then uh, there's a bunch of ongoing work actually. So we already have an uh, RFC and a PR up for uh, more backwards incompatible schema changes like you know, if you want to drop or rename like a live column, typically that breaks queries everywhere, right? But but bunch of people have been like you know uh, expressed uh, interest to have that kind of support. So we we are working on that. And the other thing that we're thinking about is uh, infinite retention, meaning um, we want to be able to support uh, every given snapshot for a for a given table. So we are redoing uh, without having to reclaim or expire snapshots and things like that. So this way we can support uh, like uh, infinite look back for time travel. And we are redoing our metadata layer uh, to in order to be able to support this. And the hoodie already comes with a whole bunch of like uh, indexing mechanisms here. Um, you know, we have HBase indexes, simple like which is join based indexing, Bloom local indexes, and uh, the way we are building it is uh, in the metadata table, we have different partitions, which are uh, essentially put together. You have multi-model indexing, and there's a whole bunch of work going on around all of these different kinds of indexes. 
concurrency control uh, so interestingly hudi did not need multi writer support for a long time that's because hudi treats from the first day it, it treated writers and different services differently and then try to implement let's say compaction we try to make it uh, not block uh, writing right because otherwise uh, your writers have to pass uh, as you are compacting uh, so you might as well like you know compact in line right so this table services actually satisfy most of the need for multi writing in the project but we now added support for optimistic concurrency control as well because that comes up a lot in like pure batch like bulk write uh, pipelines so we do file level timeline consistent and then we still keep uh, mvcc for table services what what this means is typically in scheme in 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 table formats that support like i see a question around like uh, iceberg for example right um this is like one key difference for example like if you have only optimistic concurrency control your writers and your background operations all will compete for the same thing right so if you have any concur uh, concurrency uh, you're going to starve something right but hudi makes more intelligent choices there's a lot of transaction management code that we've written where uh you know so, sort of the standard clustering compaction cleaning archive like all of these like built in demons can actually run without blocking any of the writers of course the writers can block each other with occ to give you serializable snapshot isolation um but but that's that's a separate thing and uh, future i think we already are working on uh, multi table transactions we have a early version of it implemented for an internal metadata use case and we we are looking into doing uh you know fully uh mvcc log free transactions and writers we support incremental and batch write operations we automatically do file sizing layout control sorting compression index maintenance a whole bunch of things goes on here we support actually record level merges uh, apis so and and we enforce keys so it is one of the uh, more uh you know one of the uh, systems that actually embraces a notion of a key which you like often people are like oh i only have append only data why do you need keys <laughs> but what happens is um you know when you are let's say reboot shopping something or redo uh or like rewinding some your table when you're replaying the keys become like very important for you to avoid duplicates right so hudi embraces key as a first class citizen and then um record level metadata uh we track arrival event time watermarks and code source source cpc operations as well and reading we support like all major engines and uh we we have first class support for incremental queries and the flexibility uh you know for snapshot this is read optimized uh, modes and uh, yeah we are we are working on external bringing this as external tables everywhere and uh flexible chain stream data models as well i think we have about uh like 40 right oops sorry okay all right i'll 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 try to speed this up a little bit so we can time, have time for questions and i think we covered this enough right like uh, if you look at something like rocks db and then hudi i think the the similarities will emerge right most databases are written this way where they like have a concurrency control mechanism between the clients but then the internal demons all know each other and they can actually optimize things for them like for example in hudi um you know we can if you schedule compaction we track the plans and everything so we can avoid duplicate scheduling you can skip compacting files that are being clustered for example right and um again going back we have a rich set of platform services right there is del like delta streamer is a spark utility we have one for flink which where you can do ingestion etl um you can deliver commit notification as i mentioned there's a kafka connect saying the data quality checkers and we are going to invest more and more and this is where the community contributions have been really good uh to add more and more support right so the other thing is uh hudi already has a meta server which runs embedded because uh you know as, as we all know like cloud storage listing is expensive and then uh sometimes you know uh it when when you run things in a more continuous streaming mode we don't want to keep going to the cloud always so we actually have a meta server already running 
uh, and then I I really feel like like you know sort of like we we've gone from high meta store to kind of flat file based meta store, but I don't think they can really provide the level of performance uh, for query planning. Uh, we can do much better. So we are going to invest like a lot more on like making this more standalone and kind of like taking this prime time. A few users have been running the standalone, but but I think we we want to uh, you know provide official support in the project for that. The other thing is a cache, right? This is another large part missing to complete, you know, our database picture, if you will. Uh, like we do a lot of frequent commits, which creates a lot of small objects, right? So today you can run aggressively table services and, you know, to ensure good query performance, you can keep clustering the table, for example, but that comes at a cost. So we want to like see whether uh, we want to build like a, some sort of mutable uh, file group of our caching within Hoodie and, and like you know build on top of that and we are a very friendly community right uh, and very diverse pmc um, you know you can propose we will propose new rfcs develop discussions we use jira for tracking we even have weekly community on rotations for a, like an open source project and we you know triage issues file bugs on github and there's a whole bunch of like good work that's going on with even open PRs if you want to like engage. Most of these are marked with a big needle mover kind of label on GitHub. So if you want to look at it and and engage with us, um, uh, it's adopted pretty widely outside. A lot more at that link there. And yeah, I'll, I'll I'll now take take most of the questions. All right. What, so the first question from Andre, um, what are the difference between Iceberg and Hoodie? Is there a plan to unify the two table formats into one, but better one? Um, yeah, great question. Actually, I would love to, I, I've been actually looking at it. Uh, so if you think about it, right, some parts of Iceberg as a table format, both projects are Apache projects, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm all for doing that. In fact, there's actually a ticket. If you go to the Apache Jira, uh, there's a ticket that we filed like long ago. Uh, if anyone's interested, I'll be happy to you know help help someone uh, do it. Uh, if we can fit all of the table services, that platform services, uh, and you know indexing and all of that on top of the iceberg format in, within the project and abstract it out, that that I think unify the communities in some way as well. Uh, so that that may be a good thing. And, and the differences themselves, I think I think I covered a bunch of these things, right? Like uh, we have we are like a complete platform from a capability standpoint. And then we have incremental record level incremental streams, right? Indexing, um, we try to, <clears throat> like our demons kind of like our table servers are all built like a database. So there are very fundamental design differences between the two projects in my opinion. And what's the maximum throughput when writing data? How many commits per second? So hoodie is still like you know like we uh, we we try to optimize for streaming writes, but commits even with Kafka Connect Sync, we try to aim for a commit per minute. That's kind of how you can how much you can go, right? Maybe this will change if when we get a caching layer on top. That's how bad we are going, but that's uh, uh, I wouldn't like yeah a minute or a few seconds is is what what it is. It's not a whole DP system end of the day. It's still like uh, like a more bad like micro batch or mini batch, if you will, system, right? And maximum throughput, uh, I mean, it's horizontally scalable. That's the one thing, right? And you can you can read some of our blogs. Uh, it, 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 it's like any database, right? It, it needs, uh, with, the, with the right set of tuning, I think you can take it to uh, really large volumes, like a terabyte per hour, like many terabytes per hour, uh, many GBs per second. Uh, people have done that. Yeah, I'm not sure about the slides themselves. I think those questions are probably better asked in the event thing. I think pretty sure someone will answer there. Um, do we have any any other questions? There's some probably in the QA. Have you, can you benchmark the network or any solutions on this three? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> any session I make will will be biased, right? So uh, 
yeah i mean like we we try to tend to focus on uh like uh, like you know improving hoodie right that that is a large uh, amount of work by itself uh i at least uh, the all these projects are fast evolving right so it is actually hard for someone or any one project to have like a table of some sort up to date uh that's kind of added us but i think in in if you i would say for hoodie right if if you want to build uh, you have a bunch of data some cdc logs everything raw data you want to build a data lake i think hoodie has the best support for you to just get started and kind of like have an operational data lake and and if you want to do things more uh more quicker uh more incrementally uh hoodie is i think in my opinion hands down the the best suited for that right uh and i think uh if you're on uh, databricks i think uh delta lake is heavily optimized with the runtime there's a delta cache and like like a delta engine whatever right there's a bunch of like proprietary functionality right um um but that's you know you're you're like but some of something like clustering uh which is proprietary in databricks runtime around delta is you know you can find it for free in apache open open source so it really depends on whether you want to do it yourself or you know on on all of that right and yeah i, I actually think more like uh you know hoodie's goals were around incremental data processing originally right uh, that is still uh, i think the large focus of the project but we had to build a lot of the table format kind of functionality the database functionality to actually achieve that so that's where i think there's some overlap but over time i think it will be very clear that uh like as we you know approach the incremental vision more and more so so in this yeah so in the order of the questions for, again from andre uh OCC is limiting writers. Uh, my experience iceberg is 10 to 15 comments per minute. Yeah, it's very hard to answer these questions without like context into this. I don't know how like you can do 10 to 15 comments per minute without, let's say, creating more small files, right? If you over provision, yeah, maybe you can do it, right? See, all of these things run on some something like Spark and write Parquet end of the day. So if you can scale that out, maybe it will work. Right. The main point I was trying to make with OCC is you can uh, with hoodie you can do those commits while compaction is also running, not blocking the writer. Right. That's the main 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 thing. And Thomas's question around hoodie or DataBricks Delta. So the DataBricks part uh, I mentioned, right, which is the the Delta open source. There's the De De Delta Lake open source versus DataBricks Delta, which has a lot more proprietary features. Right. Uh, Hoodie, for the most part, has the data plane, all of those proprietary fe features in open source. Uh, the query engine performance is pretty much like, you know, what Apache Spark or it, it's controlled by the query engines, more or less, right? While we help with clustering and removing metadata modelings and everything. Um, the other thing is something like merge and read is not supported on, on, on Delta Lake, right, as a format. So really, so if you're trying to do uh, in just a bunch of like large uh, database tables downstream, and then or you have like a lot of deletes, uh, having merge on read is going to come pretty handy, I think. Uh, but Delta Lake is very optimized within Databricks. In Kafka, some nice duplicates, is it possible? Yeah, so uh, I think another question from uh, Viking, right? Uh, so that is something, for example, going back to my question, uh, my answer on uh, on Delta Streamer and the tooling, right? This is a, 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 there's a flag in the Delta Streamer utility where you say drop duplicates, and then Hoodie can, uh, you know, deduplicate. Uh, like, even if you have duplicates in Kafka, you can use a key and then deduplicate it before you write it out into the storage. So you can be guaranteed that there are no, there are no duplicates then let's say Kafka has an issue or you're re rewinding your job and all of that. Yeah, it can, it, it has built in support for that. Um, data lineage, no. Uh, we actually plan to integrate with other players here, uh, right? Uh, because that is something that uh, needs more deeper query engine integration as well. 
it's probably and also data lineage people typically want to even sorry track across databases kafka lake warehouses and everywhere right so this one i think we will mostly provide data up like for example um writing a like a, a atlas sync or like you know some sync process uh, where we can once a commit lands we can push the lineage information out that that is kind of integrations that we are looking to do if i have 365 partitions okay can i can i write each partition separate one partition per second yeah you should be able to do that that's what occ uh, you can write you can run 365 transactions in parallel if if, if that's what you mean but like with Eric iceberg or anything else that takes a lock all these 365 writers would uh you know <laughs> lock right take a lock so i mean my meta point i think andre for for a lot of your questions the point is less about hoodie versus iceberg uh except for the occ mvcc parts uh, where i feel uh we may have more transaction throughput, but fundamentally, this is not a transactional database, right? So none of these things are uh, like the, the hoodie iceberg delta. So if you try to do this many pi, like transaction per second or something, then yeah, that's not, not the right kind of usage for these systems in my opinion. yeah so uh thomas so you you can configure the cleaner to say okay retain only last n days and there is a save point mechanism where you can say uh it's like a like a database snapshot you'll say okay keep this snapshot though around uh you can do things things like that but i think there are some known gaps around around this and and this is more conceptual i think uh let's say you want to delete a user's record from all versions of the data that is not something that is readily supported today uh i'm actually looking for uh someone to deeply understand um, these policies and then see if we can add, add it up so i'll be more than happy to connect you connect with you on on slack if you have these use cases and then we can it, it, we, we can actually build, build a lot of this up so in short, there is like basic support uh, for data deletions and like all of that and, and expiring older data. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to deeply understand this uh, because there is ML feature stores which want to retain every version of the data. And then there is data deletion privacy policies which want to you know delete some user records. So all of these are a little bit at, like they want different things. Uh, we, we have like similar like use cases reported like from like users like Robinhood, for example. And uh, so yeah, I'm 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 really interested to understand this more. So maybe I'll take one more question and then we can wrap. Uh, the great questions, guys. This, this is so awesome. Sorry for rushing through the later later half of the slides. All right, all right. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I think I was a little less energy because it's so early <laughs> here. But yeah, thanks for showing up. I know, uh, and 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 uh, you know, I hope to connect with uh, a lot of you on the on the community. Bye bye.